I want to speak this morning, um, maybe you could say a, a strange subject, but it's the time of the year when the church has chosen to remember this. They call it epiphany, which means the shining, the blazing forth of light. And it's in Matthew chapter 2. Now, I'm going to read it. And whenever I say about guys coming from the East to worship Jesus, everybody immediately thinks of their Sunday school little thing and uh, shepherds and kings and what have you. Um, shall we maybe for the first time read it from the Bible instead of what religion has dished up to us? Listen, and listen carefully, because this is the only time this is mentioned in the Bible, which means that you have to become a Holy Spirit led detective to find out really what's going on here because you've only got a few words to work with so listen now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king magi that's the translation of the New American Standard some of you have wise men it's an absolutely forget that translation the word is in the original language, magi, and I'll tell you what they were in a minute. And they came from the east. That would be the region today of Iraq, Iran, um, maybe even pushing up toward Russia, uh, even toward India, but um, Persia in those days, which is Iran today, uh, is about it. The magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem and they were saying where is he who has been born king of the Jews for we saw we saw his star his his star in the east and have come to worship him when Herod the king heard this he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him Gathering together all the chief priests, scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And then quoting Micah chapter 5, A new Bethlehem, land of Judah, no means least among the leaders of Judah. Out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi, and determine from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the child, and when you found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way. And the star, which they had seen, had seen, in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was when they saw the star they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy after coming into the house they saw the child with Mary his mother they fell to the ground worshipped him then opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Okay, this story I said is, is the story of the beginning of the light, radiant light. All through the Old Testament it had been prophesied that this was not only for the Jews. This was the light that should be to all nations, to all peoples. As far back as Abraham, it was said, his descendant, the descendant of Abraham, it said, in him all families of the earth, all families of the earth would be blessed. And so this is the story of that beginning. 
right at the birth of Jesus or thereabouts. Now, the, these guys, let's start further back. The Jews, which of course Jew, he comes from the tribe of Judah, and but by this time no one could really tell who was who in terms of tribes, and so they all accepted the term Jew that came into being around 500 years before Jesus. They started calling them Jews. Uh, but they were Israelites, um, Jews, and they had what we now call the Old Testament. And you might remember they were scattered among the nations. Do you remember that? It was the Babylonians to begin with. Well, prior to then, the Assyrians had taken 10 tribes and then the Babylonians and they carried Israel in bits and pieces captive and they took them to the east. They took them, first of all, to Babylon, but then they, they'd already taken to Persia greatly and many of those going to Babylon went to Persia and they carried with them the scrolls of their prophets. Please understand me. Um, we don't think about these things too often. But here are a group of prisoners of war. They have nothing but the clothes on their back, but their leaders are carrying the scrolls of the prophets. Now, one of those prisoners of war, do you remember him, Daniel? Do you remember what happened to Daniel? He was placed in university in Babylon and when he graduated, he joined a group of persons that our Bible has translated wise men, but the word is the same as this word, magi. He became one of the leaders of the magi, if you read the whole story of Daniel. And in fact, there's chapters in the book of Daniel that are not written in Hebrew. They are written in the language of the Babylonians and the Magi. And he passes on. Have you ever thought of the Daniel being sort of the bridge between? He, he knows his God. And now he's part of the Magi and he passes all his stuff that he's written on to them for them to study. They're, they're not believers, but they, they're interested in studying this kind of stuff. And so scattered across the East, there has been the holy books of our Old Testament, the prophets of a coming Messiah, and especially Daniel, because he almost prophesied the date of the coming of Jesus. It was out there. Not that anybody took it too seriously, not that anybody suddenly wanted to sign up and become Jews or start going to the temple. But they were fascinated. They were fascinated by the Jews anyway. Weird bunch. They had an invisible God. Who has an invisible God? Everybody has a little God you stick on the shelf. These people had an invisible God. And he talked to them. And he liked them. He entered into covenant with them. Believe me, these things were talked about all over the East. The, 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 the Jews, they're strange people. Strange people. And in the east, they came to build synagogues. And what's in the synagogue? Nothing, just a room, nothing. And they're holy books. There's no idols, there's no pictures, there's just the invisible God. Oh yeah, they were the talk of the town in many respects. Nobody went to do anything about it, but it was, and then the rumor of the Messiah, and it was called the hope of Israel, that one is coming. And so, you can understand that this idea of Messiah, rumor though it was, and just a rumor, but it was an expectancy of the Jews that spilled over into their neighbors because they talked about it. But it was to their neighbors a vague idea. Uh, Messiah sounds a jolly good idea anyway, but I mean, it, it's indistinct. They didn't have the history. They didn't have the scriptures that the Jews had. So they were in the dark, in the darkness of the lie. And yet there were shafts of light that the Jews left behind them wherever they were. These guys, the Magi, 
would know about those shafts of light more than anybody else. Not because they were that interested, it's just because they were students of that kind of thing. They knew they were not. And as I say, Daniel had been one of them back there in Babylon. And so we have them, the Magi who came to worship Jesus. Now, as I get into the story, some of you have heard this before, but as you get into the story, we've got to realize the story that we've been told is garbled nonsense that's been peddled to us by religious. You see, nowhere in scriptures does it say there were three anything. Nothing. That was based on they brought three gifts. Well, the kind of gifts they bought, you'd need a half an army to pay for them. And so I wouldn't wonder there's a lot more than three who kicked in to pay for them. Gold, frankincense, myrrh, you couldn't have chosen more expensive things. But then they're not kings. Who on earth said they were kings? There's not a mention of it in the, it just says the three guys or whoever came from the east. And I'm going to tell you, that was no star. Not as we understand stars, that's for sure. And it says that they came after Jesus was born. They weren't there at the manger. In fact, it says they went to the house where Jesus was. And also the word used for Jesus when he spoke to the shepherds, they were told a newborn baby, a newborn baby, and you'll find him in a manger. To these guys, it says, A, they went to the house, but B, to a child. And the two words in the Greek language are very specific. Those who heard that to go to Bethlehem to the manger, they would find a newborn. There's a word for that in Greek, a little newborn baby. The word child is a word in Greek which means a two-year-old or even a three-year-old, and he's in a house. So obviously, when this took place, they've moved out. The crowds that forbade them a room the night Jesus was born, they've moved on. Tourism is, is over, at least for the present. They're able to buy a house or rent a house. And they've been there now for two years. They didn't go back to Nazareth, maybe because of the scandal of Mary being pregnant before they were married. Do you get the picture? Okay. Wise men. No, they weren't. I mean, it's a good enough title if you want it, but Magi is the word, and Magi is back there. You read stuff back there. It's all over the place in ancient literature. These, they were a fraternity. Maybe call them that, frat house. It was a fraternity or a guild. Do you have that word over here, a guild? Um, of really priests, because it was to do with their religion. Uh, but they were locked in. Of all the things they did, they were locked into astronomy. They were incredible astronomers. It was some relationship to these people who built Stonehenge in England and built uh, similar things all over the world that if you know what to do with them get inside those places they built and, and you can look at the stars through the slits they made and you can follow the stars and you can know which day it is because they they were incredible in their knowledge of astronomy long before telescopes and, and in fact, when they studied the stars, they would lay on their back all night. So all they could see was the sky, and they would watch the stars. And in Latin, that was called considere, from which we get the word consider. Have you considered that? Have you laid on your back in the grass all night to think about this? That, that's what these guys did. They were astronomers as I say, from Persia and ancient Babylon, but also they studied astrology, not only astronomy, but astrology, which places them very much in the realm of a new ager today. Uh, they studied the signs of the zodiac, which was around at that time. They had also 
cut the sky up into parts to say that what happens over there is to do with this people, this nation. What happens over here is to do with, and there was a quadrant of the sky that was for the Jewish people. Unfortunately, they also dabbled in sorcery and were known locally as magicians. They were also very powerful men, very powerful. People were scared of them, if anything. They were very rich, usually, affluent people. They believed in one God, which was very unusual in those days. And they called that one God Wise Lord. Uh, they believed there was that one God who created the universe. They had a very high standard of morals. They were nice guys. Um, <clears throat> they were herbalists. They were naturopathic doctors. They, the way they explained life is it goes around in circles. And I can understand why they did that, because the moon rises and the moon you know, wax and wane of the moon comes and it goes, but we know it's coming again, and around it goes, and around it goes. And they had their months by the lunar canada. Um, but then they said, that's life. To them, history went around and around and around. That is, there was no point. There was no ultimate meaning. It wasn't going anywhere. It just went around and around and around. It's the foundation of what some religions come up as reincarnation. If you're here today, you're gone tomorrow, you'll be back, and around we go, around and around. It was the wheel of nature. No goal, no end. I suppose if you want to think of these guys, um, think of MIT professors yeah. who taught a kind of theology in the, as I say, they believed in one God, but it was entwined with new age and the signs of the Zodiac. And these guys are lost in their darkness. They are lost, totally confused, but they think that this is the truth. And these are the guys that picked up Daniel and the prophets of the manuscripts that they had around, and they studied them. They weren't seeking after God. They believed that arrived. I, I want you to know that. They were just going about their business, studying the stars, and studying all the mysteries that they had created out of their own head, because they didn't only study Daniel, they studied all other religions too. Oh, crazy mixed up people. Watching the stars in their own deep spiritual darkness. Now this is the first thing that arrests me in this story. That God loved these people. And there's no mention that he even told them they were wrong. That's interesting in terms of witnessing. <laughs> he, he never went and says, you're all wrong. He certainly never said, you're all going to hell. He, he loved them. And they were not seeking after God, but God took the initiative of love and reached out to them to bring them to Jesus. The light that shone, which this story really is all about, is a light that originated in the heart of God's love for people that had no interest whatsoever in pursuing him. I mean, get this picture. I've meditated on this for years. I mean, it was just another night. Just another Thursday night, you know. Go out there, lay on your back, arrange yourself for the night. You're just going to be looking at the stars and watch as they go across the sky. Huh. They're there for the duration of the night 
They had no idea that this night is going to change their life forever. Because out from the sky, this is what I love. He didn't send them a prophet. That, no, they wouldn't have listened to prophets. Can you imagine going to these guys with God's spiritual laws and saying, do you know? No, they wouldn't have been interested, let alone begun to understand you. Please understand this. Our God is bigger than all our silly little witnessing programs. <laughs> yeah. God called them. And he called them from the sky. Not with a voice. He didn't. There's no voice. He, he was almost playing hide and seek with them. Well, he's got to get their attention. So he gets into that place, which is their obsession. And he just sends out a little message. But it was a little message that absolutely blew their head apart. Because what they saw, and they saw it in that quadrant of the sky reserved for the Jews. They saw. Now, I'll give it to you. Call it a star. But if you, re if you heard me read that story, that's not the story of a star by any means. But I suppose a blazing light in the sky... I've got no other word for it, especially if I lived then when they didn't have words for comets or anything else. It was a, a, a bla but it was a blazing light, and it had never been there before. So something's happened in that quadrant to the sky. That doesn't mean that God is in to the signs of the zodiac or to the astrology of the New Age. God's not into it, but he's not going to condemn them. He's going to get inside what they believe and talk to them in a language they understand. So the only name they could think of was Star. But what they saw was far beyond any astronomy that anybody had ever discovered. And I'm going to say it was the glory of God the light radiance that God is, God is light. That's what they saw. And many of the words used here in that story, if you heard me read it, are the same words that would be used at the pillar of uh, cloud by day and the fire by night. I mean, I read it. Did you hear it? Or did the Christmas pageant get in the way? I mean, it says that the star went before them. And then it said it stood over the house where Jesus was. That, that doesn't sound like Mars or Jupiter. Um, you know, if I'm in San Antonio and I said a star led me up 16 and, and then came over 902 13th Street, you'd think I'm nuts. No, a, a star is a star is a star is a star. Light in the, this apparently was a star, but it kind of got out of the sky and went in front of them and over the top of them. And do you know what I'm going to say? I believe what they saw that night, that blazing light in the sky, is what the shepherds saw the night Jesus was born when the sky was filled with the glory of God and the angels singing glory to God in the highest, that reflected in the sky to these guys. They were seeing the night Jesus was born and they saw the glory of God in the sky. But they're totally confused. Really what they're hearing but don't realize it is God saying, I love you and I'm coming to you where you are. And I'm going to take you where you cannot now even think or imagine. But of course, that's not how they saw it at the time. Although they began to act in accord with that. I, I can't emphasize enough. Today, they would be labeled. For what, actually, when I say that, it's not a negative. Because that's what they were. 
They were New Agers. They were pagan. They worshipped a false god. Their religion was a false religion of the darkness. So I keep going. They were lost. They were sinners. And they're wrong in everything they did and thought. Very educated sinners. But you see, and this is the church today, and I'm speaking to some that really would come under the idea of what I call religion, that they would simply dismiss them as that. They're sinners, they're pagans, they're new ages. Forget it. God can't speak to them until they get their act together. They've got to repent and they've got to believe and then God can speak to them. They've got to go through the whole, I'm wrong. Renounce, renounce it all. Renounce all my associations with the stars and with, we've we've got a whole paraphernalia that's got to go through the, until you can be ready to hear God speak to you. And here's God. When God, this God, the real God, is the one that condemned the sorcery and condemned studying the stars. And God can do what he jolly well wants. And if he's going to walk in the middle of their false religion in order to talk to them, I've found a new dimension to love. Love says they're lost. And as we've said so many times before, lost means something that's precious. Lost means you're so precious. It's worth moving heaven and earth to find you. Lost means something I can't live without has gone missing and I'm coming to get it. Yes, they were lost, but God calls lost precious as they're wandering in this wilderness of death. Well, then let me say, put it, God seeks us where we are, not where we're supposed to be. God never comes and says, when you get here, I'll talk to you. He never says, you're not supposed to be here, you're wrong. So I won't talk to you until you get here. Religion invented that scenario. God never ever talks to us about where we should be, ought to be. Always about where we are. He joins us where we are. And he says from where you are, we've got a straight course home. I've come and I've found you. But let me say this very quickly. that When we say God loves all these people, the false religions, and I better define love. Because again, what goes on out there, if you get on the internet and get stuck in some web of new age, you'll find they talk about love and unconditional love to boot. However, they never mention Jesus. Fascinating. They can talk about love and never mention Jesus. If it's at all, they say Christ but by Christ, they mean some, and they'll say it, the Christ spirit. It's got nothing to do with the historical Jesus. Let's get this straight, as plain as we can say, that God's love is not, it's not just patting these pagans on the head and saying, I love you. That's not what I mean when I say God loves the lost and the likes of this. Love is not abstract. It's not some yucky, marshy land that has no sort of real boundaries to it. Love is very specific. When God says love, he spells it J-E-S-U-S. God cannot express love except through Jesus. Do you you understand When we say the word Trinity, it's a word which means that the Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father, in the Spirit. 
which means the Father can never work independently of the Son. They are one. The Son can never speak, act independently of the Father. They are one. The Spirit never shows us anything that's other than what the Father says and does and what the Son says and does. Three distinct each I can call God, but the Father is not God without the Son. The Son is not God without the Father. The Spirit is not God without the Father and the Son. And that's why Jesus is called the Word. Whenever the Father speaks, we hear Jesus speak. He's the Word of the Father. And the Holy Spirit takes the word and puts it into us. One God, but Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And therefore, the Father never, independent of the Son and the Spirit, just loves and is a nice old grandfather and plays with the grandkids. Whenever the Father speaks, whenever the Father speaks, whenever the Father speaks, you hear Jesus. He is the Word, the revelation, the expression of the Father to perfection. And therefore, when Father says, I love you, it is Jesus' voice I hear. And when the Father says, I call you to my love, he's calling us to Jesus. And when I say Jesus, I don't mean a disembodied spirit. I mean the incarnate God, God who became one of us because he loved us. And when I say that, I've just said it, haven't I? He didn't say where we ought to be. He came where we were. So God's love came and lived inside and still lives inside our humanity, still with a body like our body, God came where we are. Not to necessarily agree with everything we were doing, but to meet us where we are and bring us to himself. And somehow, and this is fascinating to me, somehow these chaps knew that. I don't know how they knew it, except the, the prophets had spoken of Messiah, a person. But they called it his star. See, religion calls it the star of Bethlehem. Oh, of course they would. Don't ever bring Jesus into it. No, they, they never said the star of, never said the star of Bethlehem. It was his star. That glory in the sky that they saw somehow told them it's a person. And it's a person who is God. Because they got their gifts to go and they told Herod to worship him. They didn't go to meet the latest king. They said, we have come to worship him. And they got all that from the star. Luke 15 says this, you know, the seeker goes where the lost is. That makes sense. If you lose something, you go where you, you lost it. The shepherd went into the wilderness where the sheep was. He didn't stand on the edge of the wilderness and say, get your act together, repent of what you did, and I'll be here. He came when the sheep was having a heyday in the wilderness and he interrupted the party, you know. God comes where we are. I don't know what this does to you, but to me it is such a relief that when I am at my worst and my most stupid, God is perfectly at home there. Have you read? The incarnation means that God is at home with me in my darkness at my worst, when I'm as stupid as I can be, he sits down and says, we'll start right here. That, to me, is the gospel. It's the gospel. It's, 
He, de he delights in meeting us where we're not afraid of him, even though we're out of our mind. So Moses, in that, you see, Moses, I don't know if you realize, it was very used to bush bushes that jumped into flames. That was his day. Because if you go to that area, it's about, it gets to 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the day. It's in the Sinai Peninsula there where Moses was looking after sheep. And, and if you go there in a, in a given day, it is no big deal for a bush to suddenly leap into flames because of the heat. And, and um, so God says, okay, this is, you know, he, he won't be upset by that. He won't be afraid of it. He just says, oh, there's another bush. You know. it, it got weird when the bush was not consumed and when the leaves were still green. That drew him, but you see, I don't know if I'm communicating, how, how God comes right where we are. The burning bush was no accident. Uh, he didn't just say, well, I'm God, I'll be in a bush. It, it was for Moses. Moses, you, you, and he got right up to the bush before God says, hello, you know, and, 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 and take off your shoes, you know, it's holy ground. Um, and Peter, who apparently didn't have much time for Jesus at that point, and, and, and so Jesus fills his boat with fish. Have you ever thought that, that Peter was a fisherman? So that means God met him in, in his business, and he, in fact he'd never had such a catch of fish. He was never going to have such a catch of money when he sold them in the marketplace. But God met him there with fish. If it had met Moses with fish, Moses wouldn't know what to do with it. But you think about it, how God meets with us. And, and Gideon, you know, scared spitless, hiding in the wine press. Where does God meet him? Right at the door of the wine press and says, oh, the Lord is with you. And, and Moses says, you're crazy. The Lord is with me. Give me a break. The Lord says, oh, no, you're a mighty man of valor hiding in the wine press. But um, do you get what I'm trying? I, I don't honestly, I'm being honest. I, I don't know if I'm getting through, but stars in the night sky, this was their expertise. Most people would look and dismiss it as very interesting. But the, these guys, this star drove them crazy. Because they knew the stars and they knew which what was supposed to happen. It wasn't. It was something. What is it? I can see them getting up from their turf and talking to the other. What, what is it? What does it mean? Because remember, they're astrologers. They, they can't, they're not just astronomers. So they're not only saying the stars there. But as astrologers and studying the zodiac and the whole new age thing in the sky, there, there's got to be a meaning. So what is it? Yeah, I mean, it would fill weeks of discussion, debate, calling in other, uh, the Magi, come, come and examine this, look at it. What conclusions? I love it. God has gone fishing. He's got a bait up in the sky and he's fishing for star people. You know, let's. And that's all he does. He puts a light in the sky. See what they do with that. There's, there's no voice, no explanation. Just let them play with this. They couldn't resist it. Nobody could convince them to stop and get on with life. No. This is something. No. Oh. It's his method. Every one of us here, in some way or another, because obviously each one of us are unique to the love of God. But how, how did he get us? Why are you here? <laughs> he dropped a question into our life that not only got our attention, but we couldn't resist it. And 
question that to another person wouldn't have meant anything. But there was a question of a kind, something. And, and, and it would be within our familiar. And yet there was something behind that familiar that was beckoning us. And, and we, I say it again, couldn't we say it? We thought we, we've settled this. We don't have to think about this anymore. And here comes a question in the middle of it that shatters everything we've ever believed. And I don't know, I, I've got to pursue this, I've got to pursue it. And, and we might not even want to tell the closest people to us, we feel odd about it, but we're, we're drawn. Maybe some of you are right in the middle of a question right now, and it's bugging you. We're arrested. It's, it's pointing, beckoning to something unusual, unexpected. Because God always uses a bait that attracts us. <laughs> you see, love, God is love. He cannot, by his being, he cannot manipulate us. Love can never manipulate. No, love never can dominate. Love can't force Love could only draw you and arouse in you desire, longing, curiosity, questions that haunt us day and night. You wake up in the night thinking about it. And that's what happened to these guys. They want to follow the bait. They've got to know. Something has happened within Judah that is bigger than anything we've ever seen before. And they knew enough about the Jewish scriptures to say it's the Messiah. And therefore it's his star. And that's what fueled their will and their choices. We, we use the expression signs and wonders. Actually there's a lot of signs and wonders but we're, we're looking for the weird. And with weird goes meaninglessness. God's signs are not like that. God's signs arrest us in an area of the familiar. But they fill us with questions and wonder that is leading us to Jesus. A sign that doesn't lead you to Jesus is not a sign. It's just uh, weird. God loves us when we're wrong. God loves us when we're as screwed up as we can be. When we're lost and walking in the darkness. But he didn't invite them to think about it. They, they didn't think themselves to God. That would have been their M.O., their students, as I said, MIT professors. They, they were the brilliant guys of the day, intellectuals. But what God did is, is draw them to a trusting response. He has made the initiative. He puts the glory in the sky and then steps back and lets them be drawn for the Holy Spirit was at work there though he's not mentioned and they're going to trust and experience him in the trusting when they don't understand okay this is a lot of this is hard to put into words God's revealing himself revealing himself in a way you can't miss Lots of us have a star right now that's busting my mind. But they're being called not to understand it, but to respond to what they see. We think if I only understood what's going on here, then I could believe. No, you couldn't. Once you understand a bit more, you'll want more and more and more and still not believe. 
Trust is responding to what you do see, even if it's as much as they saw, which was, from our point of view, nothing. Just a star in the sky? That's enough. Respond to that, there's more down the road. But you won't get the more down the road until you respond and trust what you've got now. They gather, I don't know how many there were. Doesn't really matter. They're poring over their maps of the sky. They're each putting forward their ideas. Some are quoting from Jewish prophets. And then the star disappeared. That star did not lead them to Jerusalem. Did you? It says they, they told Herod the star that had come to them in the east. And when they walked out from Herod and saw the star, they went berserk. Almost every word to use in the Greek language for extreme joy is used there. They, They were beside themselves. It's as if they looked at each other, grabbed and started dancing in circles. The star which we had seen is now here again. They looked at the sky back there in the east. It was gone, as if nothing had been there. But they've already settled. It's his star. It's announced to us something's happened in the land of Judah. It has spoken of a specific person, Jesus. Though they didn't know that, but they knew it was a person, God God is a baby person. They knew that. They're coming to worship him. That's amazing. Today, and I'm speaking a lot of maybe one section of the church, but today people are enamored with the signs. And we want more signs and bigger signs. And we try to build a church on signs. This star disappeared. It had done its job. We don't start a church on the great star. It did its job. It's disappeared. Stop looking for stars. You've got the message. There's only one thing to do now. Act on it. We want more stars. My church is bigger than your church because I found another star. You know, I'm not going into that desert until there's a trail of lights across the desert. Bigger lights than your lights. Colored lights. Blinking lights. No. Not in the Bible. They don't what? They don't know. All they know something of divine importance has happened in Judah. That's all they know. I mean, feel this. They, they don't have a picture of what has happened. In fact, the way they talked to Herod, they thought everybody must have known. They don't have a name. They don't have an address. What, should they have waited for more? No. No. When you begin a journey of trust, you don't know much more than that. You'll only know more when you act on what you do know. And the star beckoned them to Bethlehem. Well, they didn't even know that. It beckoned them to the land of Judah. They only went, oh, and there was so much to do. See, that's where, you know, the church pageants really lose it. Because, okay, even if it was three, which is just based on the number of gifts they had, but if it was three, they came from the east. (laughs) Yeah, they they come walking down the church aisle, don't they? 
That's the first we know of them. They arrived. They came from the east. Have you ever stopped to think what that meant in those days? I mean, I've, I've gone on this journey, um, not physically, but I, I've got my maps, and I've walked this journey on a map. I mean, this is going to take them, the whole journey round trip is about two years. Well, it's what about that? Well, can't get a subway to Bethlehem. It's, you're going to trek across the desert on a camel. And that's going to take you eight months across the desert. Then you're there. Then you've got to do a U-turn and eight months back. I say it's about two years before they see their families again. What are they going to tell them? No. We're going on a trip. Why? Well, a star. <laughs> and then they didn't carry gold, frankincense, and myrrh in their back pocket. You've got to buy that. And that's why I believe it was quite a few of them because they're all going to chip in. Because it wouldn't be just a little gold coin. They were bringing a substantial amount of gold for the person they believed to be Messiah. God indeed. They got a, where are you going to purchase it? You go in Walmart and say, I'd like two tons of gold. You know, it's, where are you going to get it from? The myrrh, the frankincense, they were precious herbs, still are. You just don't go and buy them. And then you're going to go across the desert. Eight months. Well, where are you going to sleep tonight? There's no motels. There's no road. There would be, you'd have to find servants for each astrologer. Cooks. Gotta eat. And I'll need something like a carpenter. Could few of them actually if there's more of us. Because they've got to put up tents. Have you ever been in, in a tent of these people who live in the desert? I have. It's bigger than this whole room. Beautiful. Beautiful tents with hangings, curtains. And And if there's, what, shall we say, five of them? Six? Twelve? That's not too many. Uh, they've seen this and they're going to go. And they're not going to sleep all in barracks. And I mean, these are affluent people. I don't know how many tents they had to take with them. Them for the servants and the cooks. Oh, but just a minute. You're really serious. You're not going to walk off in the desert with gold, frankincense, and myrrh just sitting on the back of the wagon? That number one would take at least two camels. But I'm not going to... Deserts were full of crooks and bandits. and You're a sitting duck walking through the desert. They would have hired an armed guard to guard that treasure that they took with them and guard them from the bandits. Because you need camels too. Each man has a camel, two or three camels for the baggage and the tents. Throw in a few camels for the servants. Probably the armed guard need a camel or two. You ever thought of this? Because you've never thought of going across the desert, have you? But what about the map? <laughs> there is no map. That's a weird feeling. I've been there. You go out to the Cascade Mountains outside of Portland, Oregon. You go up into the mountains. You come to a sign. You are now walking off the map. Beyond this sign, it is unmapped. 
never been there. It's not a nice feeling. Well, there was no map for these guys. They're just going to walk into the desert, follow the stars to get to Judah. Maybe we should need a guide. Well, that's just another one on the payroll. Do you realize what these guys did was as crazy as Noah building the ark? What are you doing? But God spoke to them. Only they couldn't even be as specific as that. No, we believe. What do you believe? What have you seen? Can you imagine the relatives all sitting around? What are you talking about? I'm hiring you to come as a servant to cross the desert, you know. Where are we going? Well, we're not too sure. Um, seriously, when, when the glory of God calls you to where you've never dreamt of being in relation to Jesus, it will upset your whole life. And I'm warning you, that is absolutely true. It will certainly upset your church life. It will upset all your communication with people. They will all think you've gone absolutely crazy. Because you've seen something that they haven't seen. Because remember, the star disappeared. I can't take my family out and say, now that's not that that would have done much good, but at least it would have been something. But they're left with their trust, with no information. And they don't understand fully what they're doing. And they're going to follow the direction of a star that they can no longer see. Right from the beginning, they are trusting in the God behind that light. They're trusting in God who revealed, and they don't know his name. And he's going to be the map. He's the guide. One neat thing. Maybe you've never thought of this. 2,000 years before these guys crossed the desert. 2,000 years before. Just down the road from where they lived, 2,000 years before, had lived Abraham. And Abraham had heard the same voice. Because it says in Acts 7 that the God of glory appeared to Abraham when he was in Ur of the Chaldees and said to him that he would have a descendant one day through whom all families of the earth would be blessed. And Abraham left and trekked the same desert as these guys did to the same land and waited for the descendant. Jesus was the descendant through whom all families of the earth would be blessed, not just Jews, including a bunch of Persians who lived where Abraham lived. And they left just the same way as Abraham left to follow the same trek across the desert to find the descendant of Abraham and worship him. Just a thought, just a thought. And so they set out to cross the desert. They're traveling at night. It's too hot in the day. Slow pace, long twisting caravan through the sand dunes. And they'll be traveling for a few months. What's happened? Well, a lot's happened. But one thing, do you remember I said they saw life as a circle? It goes around and around and around. What's happened here? God busted their circle. And they're shooting out to where they don't know where they're going. And they've never been there before. This isn't round and round. This is leave the circle and off out into where God calls them, which again is what has happened to every one of us. We were drawn into that presence of God that doesn't go round and round, but goes in a straight line to Jesus. 
it would have been six to eight months after they left that they arrive in Jerusalem, which was, according to what they said, two years after they saw the star. It would have caused a stir. This is not three little kings walking down the church aisle to join the manger at the front. I don't know how many. The earliest records we have from the Christians of the early, early church, they said there were 12. But that's without any... Uh, yeah. And also I can't even trust what they... It's not solid history. But let's say 12. With servants and cooks and carpenters and armed guard and camels. I mean, if that, if that came into San Antonio, yeah. boy, you'd have the news out there. What? Who? Who? <laughs> what? And, and then they they blow everybody's mind. They say, "Where where is he? You know, he that has been born King of the Jews." Like you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and of course, it, it see Herod. Herod was a madman. He should have been locked up. Um, he killed his own family because he was suspicious that they would become the king. Um, the emperor of Rome said, I'd rather be Herod's dog than his child because he's liable to murder his child, but he would feed his dog. Um, he was a... Well, he... What, what would be the word... Uh, I don't know what the word would be, but he was terrified of everybody because he thought they all wanted his throne. So if anybody actually said they wanted his throne, they were dead before morning. He had spies everywhere in his concerns, which meant the spies are rushing back. These guys come and they're talking about a king. There's only one answer to that. They've got to die, and the king has got to die. And he, he doesn't know or have a clue about anything, and so he calls the priests in. Where is this Messiah supposed to be born? And that is another story, really, but it amazes me. Here is this entourage from Persia, coming to say a king has been born. And the priests know where he's going to be born. The Messiah. It says in Micah, it says, it gives the address, it says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And, and Herod calls in the priests, it says the whole, they're all, they're, these guys are saying the king has been born, the Messiah has been, where is he going to be born? Oh, says the priest, it's right here, page 500, right here, paragraph 3. He will be born in Bethlehem of Judah. Oh, thank you. You mean all this talk that he's been born, you priests who can pull down the scroll and say, I mean, this is where it is. Five miles down the road from where they stood, Bethlehem. The priests know exactly where he's going to be born. And they could care less. That's religion. That's what I, when I say religion, you can know the scriptures. You can have memorization things from Sunday school hanging down your jacket. But you, you treat it as a hobby. Don't do anything. Don't respond. Don't. But I know it. Oh, I, I passed all the exams in my seminary. I, I know it all, but did nothing about it. Of course, it's just a jolly good hobby. That's religion. Know it? Uh, no, you don't. You know about it. They knew where Jesus was to be born. Somebody comes with a story that has got to stop you in your tracks that he's been born. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think just one of them would go down the street to find out? Uh-oh. 
And so Herod summons them secretly. Secretly because he doesn't want anyone to think he's taking them seriously. And he plies them with questions. When? When? And they narrowed it down. Two years. He says, well, it's Bethlehem. These guys, the Magi, I, I can't imagine their disappointment, confusion, the apathy of the people. I mean, these are the people of God. These are the people that have the scripture. These are the ones actually waiting for Messiah. And they don't know, and they don't care. In fact, all the people are running away from us because they're ter terrified of Herod. They don't want to be associated with these guys. I had a friend, he traveled around the world with me, Gene Lilly, and he was a complete pagan, and he'd been in a wheelchair for nearly 20 years, multiple sclerosis, to come to the point where he's dying. He was dying of MS and diabetes, and just sat in his wheelchair and watched TV all day. And happened to click on the 700 Club and heard Pat Robertson. And it was the sinner's prayer. And it was God speaking to Gene. And he prayed with Pat Robertson on the TV. And immediately went to get a Bible. Never read a Bible, never seen a Bible. And as he's reading the Bible, he comes to the words. These signs shall follow those who believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Well then, what am I doing sitting here? On Sunday, he got his wheelchair out and went to the Methodist church and went wheeled up to some people talking in the foyer and said, are you believers? Well, yeah, we're believers. He said, then would you please lay hands on me so I can get out of this chair? Because it says here that if you lay hands on me, I'll be healed. They ran for their life. He went to every church in Orlando, Florida, including the Assemblies of God. And he got the same response from everybody. Even the pastors were saying, now that was, you know, just quiet down. Until back at this was back in the charismatic days and someone came to town with great big signs signs wonders healings and he said thank god there's one person who believes it and um he was healed in that meeting we traveled around the world together but i've often thought of that we're believers of course every church in orlando we're believers but when you ask me to do what believers do we run for our lives how stupid can you be to think that God really meant it? The apathy, the people of God. Jean Lily had seen a star that says you're going to be healed. So where do I go? I go to church. Of course I go to church. That's where the people of God are. And then they all run for their life. And they come out with scribbled directions to a little village five miles down the road. And it says they saw the star that they had seen in the east. They haven't seen the star. And the, the what is it that he says? Um, yeah, and the star which had, they had seen in the east went on before them until it came to the place, stood over where the child was. It says, when they saw the star, listen, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That is trying to find words in the English language to say what that says. It means that they were beside themselves with joy. They're looking at each other like little kids on Christmas morning. I, it's the star. They haven't seen this star. 
for two years. It's an exceeding and uncontrollable joy that made you speechless, amazed, stand outside of yourself. It's a response to wonder. And it wasn't up there in the sky. It went before them, which strongly suggests no one else saw it. Because if you walk through Bandera with a big radiant light in front of you, you're going to get attention. But these guys, people apathetic, they didn't. And, and this is the love of God, you see. They had given themselves to what they knew. They did the most understandable thing. Ask the people of God where he is. Blank wall. And then God himself joins them. On the, now joins them. He's not up there beckoning them. He's joining them on their journey. And he is saying, it gets a bit tricky here. I'll lead you personally for the last five miles. And he led them. And the caravan, that long twisting caravan, went through Jerusalem down the road to Bethlehem. And then stood over. That really clinches it. It stood over. It's not this house. It's not that house. It's standing over this house. And it's no longer a manger. It's a house. And it's no longer a baby. And they fall down and they worship. And that night, the angel came and said, get out of here by a different route and that same angel then went to Joseph and say get out of here tonight and go as a refugee to Egypt you ever thought that Jesus spent probably the first five six years of his life in Egypt how did I mean that's that's a big thing Lock, stock, and barrel, move and get out of here into Egypt and start a new life in Egypt? It's a good job they had gold. They had money to settle. To Frankincense and myrrh would bring a high price in the herbalists of the day. They were financed by the gifts of the Magi. Love comes where we are. I don't know, I, I just... Because I know so many who just say, you know, when I, when I do this or when I do that, when I... God, me exactly where you are. He joins us in the pit of our darkness and he's perfectly at home there and says, I have a straight way out of here. He holds the keys of death and hell, which means if you're walking in a living hell, he's there. Hell doesn't belong to anybody anymore. He's got the keys. So if you're in hell, he shares your hell with you. He's at home in hell. Where we are. I feel so strongly to keep saying that. And he comes and he talks to us in a way that fits us perfectly just where we are. And he breaks into the circle of our futility around and around and around. Same old, same old, same old. And God says, Pew, no. A new way. He steers us through the desert, steers us through an apathetic, couldn't care less people of God disinterested religion it takes us to Jesus see I guess what it is this morning I have this strong sense that I'm speaking to someone who is right now in the middle of following a star and may, maybe you don't realize it but maybe if you go back a few months there's a question that was put in your heart and look at you, you're still pursuing that question. Um, 
uh, and if, it, if it's not recent, you're on this journey. And I know for many of you, you you've hit that apathetic church wall. And you, you look to the people of God to help you in this journey, and they're telling you it's of the devil. So. But in another sense, and I'll be very quick on this, the New Testament speaks very plainly and says that we are the stars. In Philippians chapter 1, I believe. Yes, Philippians chapter 1. Uh, and it says, among, speaking of the world, and already described the world as corrupt and in darkness, and it says, among whom you shine. And the word there in the Greek is luminaries. That it's very akin to star. And it's not because you're doing witnessing. You're being the glory of God. So that they come to you to ask you a reason for the hope that is in you. Think about that. You're, you are somebody's star. Somebody met you and you, just by being who you are, left them with so many questions that they've never been the same since. So what can I say? Saddle your camel. <laughs> Follow the beckoning call. Confident that he who began a good work in you will complete it in the day and in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, Father, we do give you thanks that your light beckoned us. Your light then embraced us, filled us, that we became light in the Lord. And out of us, streams, radiant streams of light. And we thank you for those right here in this extended meeting. Those who are on this journey following the questions that you placed in them. Give us all the grace to complete the journey. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen.